Good morning. Good morning. I was looking at the microphone that time. It is a blessing to be in God's house today. And an awesome opportunity that we have to begin our time of worship today uh, with the act of baptism. We have four candidates this morning who have all made their uh, professions of faith, made those professions of faith public with a desire this morning to be baptized into the fellowship and membership here at Friendship Baptist Church. And so it is a blessing to be here together today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin this time of worship together. Father, thanking you for today. Thanking you, Father, for your blessings. Thanking you, Father, for those who have come today to follow through with the act of baptism, Father. We are truly blessed beyond measure. I pray your blessings over each and every one of these candidates today, Father, that you may move in their lives, Father, they move in their families, and that you will draw them closer to you each and every day, that they may be everything you would have them to be as a child of God. Thanking you for the blessings that you give to this, your church, and Father, may we continue to seek your leadership and guidance in everything we do. We pray today in Jesus' name, amen. Our first candidate this morning, uh, Ms. Savannah King. Ms. Savannah has made public her profession of faith in Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And it is my privilege today to be able to baptize her, a sister in Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our next candidate this morning, Ms. Kendall Busby. She as well has made public her profession of faith in Jesus Christ as her Lord and her Savior and desires this morning to follow through with baptism. And so it is my privilege this morning to baptize her, a sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This morning is Miss Kennedy Lane. Kennedy comes forward this morning having made public her profession of faith in Jesus Christ as her Lord and her Savior with a desire to be baptized into the fellowship here at Friendship Baptist Church. And so it's my privilege this morning to be able to baptize her, a sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then Miss Brandy Smith. Miss Brandy as well comes this morning having made her public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as her Lord and her Savior, and her desire to follow through this morning in the act of baptism. And so it's my privilege this morning to be able to baptize her in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May God bless His church today. Thank you. While Brother Tim and, and our baptism candidates are uh, getting ready for the rest of the service, I just wanted to step up and welcome you to our service this morning. Um, it is great to be in the house of the Lord with you today. Uh, it is a great crowd, especially for a summer Sunday. Uh, we've got a lot of guests in the house this morning uh, with our uh, family members of our baptism candidates, and we appreciate y'all being here and supporting them uh, during this time of their life. 
Um, if you look on the screens, you'll see our welcome text. Uh, if you are a visitor with us today, we would like to know about you being here. So if you would, just simply send a text with the word welcome to the number 662-222-5411 and just give us your name and just let us know that you are here today. Uh, we sure would appreciate that. That way we can follow up with you if, if uh, that's what you desire. Maybe you want some information about our church and our services. Uh, we want to be able to follow up with you uh, for that. If you'll look in your bulletin, you see a couple of other announcements that are that are happening in our church. Uh, one of them, or two of them, have to do with Vacation Bible School. The first one is there is a VBS uh, workers and volunteers meeting today at four o'clock. Uh, this will be down in the children's wing. So if you are a volunteer or any type of worker for Vacation Bible School, please plan on being at this meeting at 4 o'clock today. There's a lot of important information uh, that we need to get out to you and help with that. Uh, so please make plans to be here today at 4 for that. Uh, right below that in your bulletin, you'll see a registration opportunity. So if you've got some kids or maybe grandkids or you know of some kids that uh, would want to attend our Vacation Bible School this, su uh, this summer, June uh, 13th through the 17th, there's a little QR code in your bulletin. And what you do, some of you may not know what a QR code is, and you just take your phone out and you take your camera and you don't take a picture of that little black and white box but you just hold it over that uh, QR code and you'll have a little pop-up that comes up and you tap it and it'll take you to a online registration form uh, for Vacation Bible School. Uh, if you would prefer to do an old school way we've got some um, registration forms printed off that we can give you in the office one day this week uh, but we are really looking forward to having Vacation Bible School this year. The first time we've had it in, in several years because, because of COVID and things like that so we're really looking forward to having that uh, this year uh, along with that. Uh, there's one other announcement. Uh, our youth will be going to Nashville in a couple of weeks for a mission trip. Uh, Brother Tim has been mentioning this and Number one, we appreciate your prayers as we prepare for that trip. But number two, we, uh, we would appreciate your shoes, uh, your old shoes that uh, maybe you don't need anymore. You can donate those, and we're going to uh, send them to an organization called Souls for Souls. Uh, and they take those shoes and repurpose the ones that are beyond repair, or they'll redistribute those to people who need them. Uh, so if you've got some old shoes laying ar around the house that you didn't really know what to do with you can bring them by the church and we would uh we'll take them with us when we go um at this time i'm going to ask our children if they would line up for our children's church this morning miss Brittany is going to take them back uh, our children's church is for uh children up to eight years old uh, so if you're in that age group, if you're a child in that age group, you're more than welcome to go with them. And as Brother Tim always says, please be sure and go pick up your kids after church. We don't want to leave them here. Uh, so it's a great, look, great group of children coming forward. Let them come on through. All right. And at this time, we're going to open with a word of prayer, and we will proceed with our worship service this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us today, God. I thank you for allowing us to gather together and worship you this morning. God, I thank you for these uh, four ladies who have uh, stepped forward on, on commitment of belief in you and, and faith in you. And God, I pray that it, we, as, we as a church body can be a, a family uh, that lifts them up and encourages them and helps them grow in their relationship with you. God, if there's one here today that, that has never taken this step of believer's baptism, I pray that today would be the day they make that step. Uh, that seeing these, uh, these ladies step out in boldness and faith would encourage them to do the same. God, just be with us as we go through this worship service this morning and touch our hearts so we may live a life that's more pleasing to you. It's your name I pray. Amen. I'll let you know that I've already taken part in the Souls for Souls donating shoes. If you look in one of those buckets and see a, a canoe size 13, those are mine. <laughs> so you can put yours on top of mine, all right? Uh, it's been a little over a year ago we introduced a new hymn to our church. And as you know, the last couple of years have been odd, on and off and start and stop and strange things. But we're bringing this him back. It's a new one. And it's, it's, it has a tremendous message in that his, no matter how much sin is in our life, 
no matter how much wrong we have done, no matter how many times we have fallen, God's mercy and forgiveness is more than enough to take care of that. Now, you're gonna, uh, we're going to start this song off with the chorus, so you'll hear the chorus. Then you'll hear a verse, and there's like three verses, so you join when you're ready. So we're going to invite you to stand as we sing, His Mercy is More. So if you'll join us. Quiet. see more than the amount of our sins, but he's already paid for it. Paid for it. Our next hymn talks about that. First line, years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. We're going to sing this together. If you'll help us, please. Mercy, there was great and great. 
Thank you so much for helping us with singing. We're going to continue with another one of the great hymns. One of the great hymns. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. This is, oh, no need to talk about it. It speaks for itself. We're going to invite you to sing with us as we, as we proceed. song that I sang at my grandmother's funeral. It's a great song that talks about how God is with us through the ups, the downs, the fires, the floods, that he is always there. So if you'll listen to God leads us along. We're dealing with a fickle CD player, I'm sure, so. So we'll sit and relax for just a moment. I tell you what, I'm fixed to intervene here and we're gonna do something uncalled for. Charles, come here. Yeah, that Charles. Charles Blaylock. Um, Charles is going to give you the 60-second testimony of something that happened just this past week that 
is a testimony of how God can take a little thing and turn it into a big thing. So I'm going to let you tell your story. You got 60 seconds. Put me on a spot. I did, but I'm right here with you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, we went to a, uh, what the youth call merge, and we just all put together groups of teenagers all mending together. In there, uh, there was a friend of mine that, that was in our youth group maybe six, seven years ago. He gave a testimony on a little book that I had given away, uh, More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell. When he come out and told me that he had got away from the faith and he come back to the faith because that book, he read that book and how, how encouraging it was to him. I was at the Methodist church jumping up and down. If some of my Pentecostal friends had come by, they would have wondered what happened to him because they know I go to friendship. <laughs> but just a simple thing of a book made a difference in a youth. I was blown away. I, I'm still amazed by that I had a part in doing that. Uh, never, never, never think that what the youth are now are not what they're going to be later on because he is in the Methodist, he's a youth director of the Methodist Church. So he went all the way from being an atheist to now spreading the word. That's 60 seconds. There you go. Now that's just a word of encouragement that you don't have to be a preacher, a minister, or anything. You do the little thing that God asks you to do, and he uses it to do big things. Thanks, Charles. We ready, Anthony? So rich and so sweet God leads His dear children along Where the water's cool flow bathes the weary one's feet God leads His dear children along Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through his blood, some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Sometimes on the mount where the sun shines so bright, God leads his dear children along. And sometimes in the valley, in darkest of night, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through his blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day. So 
Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through His blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song. In the night season, and all the day long in the night season and all the day long We have been looking on Sunday mornings at how to make our home a field of dreams. Yes, I've been going deep into the baseball analogy uh, with this group of messages, and I'll stay there today and for a few more weeks as well. Uh, Looking this morning and thinking about some other things that are involved in Uh, In baseball and softball and things of that nature, we see a lot of scorebooks and, of course, scoreboards. Now, scorebooks are really valuable, necessary tools for the baseball, especially if somebody will teach you how to do them the right way, right? Yeah, okay, that's a little inside joke, but we'll go on from there. Uh, It's with that score book that you can monitor balls and strikes and hits and errors and RBIs, walks, uh, the lineup, of course, player substitutions that are there. It can allow you to actually put in the sequence of plays of how an out was made. You can do a 6-4-3 DP, which is a uh, shortstop, field of the ball, through it the second baseman, through it the first baseman for a double play. I mean, scorebooks keep up with the details of the game. All the way down to the very last out that's been recorded, that crucial detail as well. But some of those crucial details that you can find in the scorebook are also found on the scoreboard. And ultimately, that's the only thing we want to look at, really. You know, what is the final score of the game. Uh, I'm, uh, I love to watch baseball and different things through the years, especially when our boys were playing and different things. Well, I found myself last night uh, watching Southern Miss play. Not that I'm a big Southern Miss fan and certainly not a big LSU fan, uh, for some of you that are. Uh, but I was watching there and it was the eighth inning and You know, Southern was ahead, and everybody in the stadium, which was packed and probably watching on TV, thought that Southern was going to win. And if you looked at the stat book at that point, they were way ahead, both on the scoreboard and in the book. But ultimately, if you stayed up long enough to watch the end of that ball game, you realized that in extra innings, they lost. The scoreboard had something else to say. Team stats can be deceiving. It is always, listen to me now, always the team with the most runs that wins the game. In 1988, I will remember this uh, always. It's actually for Sports Illustrated, been considered one of the ten greatest moments in World Series history. Kurt Gibson hits a game-winning home run in the bottom of the ninth to lead the Dodgers to victory against the heavily favored Oakland Athletics in the game, first game of the World Series. 
Now, if you check the scorebook there, you might conclude that the injured Gibson was not much of a factor in the series. Even though he hit a home run, he actually was the MVP of the National League regular season. And yet in that 1988 World Series, he only batted once. Dodger manager Tommy Lasordo said, Gibson's home run paralyzed the A's. And it inspired our team to believe that we could win the series even though nobody gave us a chance. One at bat. One home run. He played in one game. The Dodgers beat the A's four games to one that year to win the World Series. Scorebooks keep up with a lot of information, but they don't measure things like inspiration. They don't measure motivation. They don't measure confidence. They don't measure dedication. The bottom line of making our field, our home, a field of dreams is, folks, there's a lot of other stuff out there. A lot of details that are out there. But don't get so caught up in the details that we miss the truth. Your Bible, if you'll open that with me this morning, it comes out of Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 is, of course, Jesus Christ speaking to the scribes and Pharisees again. And, and this is a group of people who, man, their scorebook looked like they were blowing it out of the water. Their scorebook looked like they had everything going for them. But the scoreboard said something totally different. Ladies and gentlemen, for us to make our homes a field of dreams, moms and dads, grandparents, church, to make our homes a field of dreams, yeah, the details, they are important, but listen, you can have all these details, you can have all this stuff together the way you think it ought to be, but if the scoreboard comes up falling against you, you're in trouble. I mean, how many times have we planned things? We thought we had everything exactly the way it needed to go. Man, we had planned it to a T, and then it didn't work out. Something changed. At the last moment, something changed. I mean, Kirk Gibson hadn't been in the game all game. Here they were at the bottom of the ninth. I mean, <coughs> let's just give him a shot. Oakland A's, you know, they were probably thinking, this guy's hurt. There's, he can't even run. Listen, he wouldn't have got a, a base hit. No way. Because he couldn't run the bases. When he hit the home run, they were wondering, is he strong enough to go around the bases? Because you've got to get around for it to count on your own. All kinds of things can happen if we're not careful. If we don't pay attention. In this text this morning, Jesus exposes the, the foolishness of allowing these insignificant details to dominate your life. Now, again, we're going to talk about the scribes and Pharisees for just a moment. That's the, the text I want to bring you together with this morning. But I'm going to expound upon that as well of how we need to make sure that we don't allow these insignificant details to dominate our life. What is really important is what's really important. Again, Matthew chapter 23, beginning with verse 23. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! 
You pay a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin, yet you neglect the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but gulp down a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside may also become clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of the bones of the dead and every kind of impurity. In the same way, on the outside, you may seem righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness." Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. Pray with me for just a moment. Father, to look into your word, to desire to know your will. Father, to desire to be who you would have us to be. Father, help us today to not drown in the details. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Pharisees had had taken things to such an extreme. They had taken the religious idea of that day and time to such an extreme that they discouraged people from really seeking God. They discouraged people from trying to have a relationship with God. Why in the world do you want to have a relationship with God if you know you're going to fail? And that's what they had done. They had set the standard so high. They even in their own mind thought that they had made it there. They haven't. But they set the standard so high that the normal, everyday, average person of that day and time would think to themselves, there's no way. I can't do that. I can't live up to that. How am I supposed to make it in that situation? Man, look what they had done. The details overwhelmed everything. Ladies and gentlemen, for us to truly have a home, to make that home a a field of dreams, we don't need to get caught up in the details. What can we do? First of all, this morning, we need to analyze our priorities. What is really a priority in our life? Jesus boldly declares that there are some things in life more important to others. He talks about a tenth of the mint and dill and cumin, and yet you neglect the more important matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. I mean, listen, that's not an ex- exhaustive list of what we are supposed to do in the eyes of God and what is important in the eyes of God. But it is a list, an idea to challenge us on what's important. To challenge us on what is a priority in our life. Let me tell you something, folks. You have a priority list. Whether you've written it down or not. You have a list of priorities in your life. You may write it down, that's great. It looks good on paper sometimes. But the priority list that you live by, the things that you actually do, those are the priorities that you have in your life. One of the most significant obstacles to greatness is being satisfied with the good. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. You don't have to worry about it. It's okay. I don't need anything else. Jesus commanded the Pharisees and commended them for doing the good things. They tithed of their possessions. They did things that they were supposed to do. And yet in verse 24, he says, Blind guides, you strain out a a gnat and gulp down a camel. Man, a gnat is a very insignificant detail in every aspect of life. Listen, why would you be satisfied? Why would you settle 
for a good marriage when you can have a great marriage. And yet some people settle for all the wrong things. Why in the world, parents, do we, do we look at the gnats in our children's lives, the little bitty things, and we miss out on the big things? You know, when we analyze our priorities, when we really figure out what's important to us, we are able to see the big picture. We're able to see everything. And sometimes we're able to see even the way God would want us to. We don't need to crush the dreams of our children, to break the spirits of our children. We don't need to emphasize those things that are so little, so insignificant over things that really matter. To analyze our priorities. Uh, the Peanuts comic strip. There's a lot of insight <laughs> into that comic strip. And one of those comic strips is Charlie Brown declaring his dreams of how he desires to impact the world. <clears throat> and of course, there's always Lucy hanging around. And if anything's going to go the other direction, it's going to be with Lucy, right? Well, here's Charlie Brown raising his hands into the world, and he says, "These hands may be, which may these are the hands, excuse me, which may someday do marvelous works. These are the hands which may someday accomplish great things. These are the hands." which may build bridges or heal the sick or hit home runs or write soul-stirring novels. These are the hands which may someday change the choice of destiny. Lucy looks at Charlie Brown's hands and says, those hands have jelly on them. <laughs> Analyze our priorities. Man, to make our home a field of dreams, guys, we need to build up our children. I hope and I pray that there are children in the world today who may someday impact and do marvelous things and do great works who will build bridges who will heal the sick hit home runs write soul stirring novels our kids your kids who knows what God has in store for them analyze the priorities parents don't focus on the little things. Who cares if they've got a little jelly on the hands? Who cares if they got a little dirt on their fingers? Who cares when they mess up and make a mistake? We teach them. We love them. We keep going. We analyze our priorities. But then what do we do after that? We need to avoid then paralysis. Now, having identified the most important, <clears throat> what is the most important, we've analyzed the priorities around us, we must act upon that information. Listen, there's a lot of people out there <clears throat> who miss the important things of life not because they haven't taken time to figure out what the important things are, but they just seem paralyzed to make the changes. Listen, if you know that you need to make a change in your life, make it. If you know there's something better, then go for it. 
Don't be so scared of life, of failure, of the world in which we as believers live in, that we miss out, that we, uh, we become, uh, that the paralysis of life just overtakes us, that we don't do what we know we need to do. To be the very best God wants us to be. Someone made it, <clears throat> made that statement kind of this way. He said, sadly, people have become so consumed with the details of making a living that they've forgotten how to make a life. Man, it's not about making a living. And it's not about our kids being perfect. But it is about living a life that loves the Lord. Living a life that loves our children. Living a life that has some fun in it. That is a good time. That has joy. And all kinds of pleasures that come from the Lord, of course, in so many different ways. Man, to avoid that paralysis, folks, we need to pursue purity. Now, he said in verse 26, blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside of it may also become clean. Now, he, he's talking about their, their bodies. He's talking about who they are. Man, <clears throat> how many times have you grabbed a cup off a shelf? You, didn't, you don't pay any attention to the inside. If the outside looks clean, you think, oh, it's supposed to be clean. You put some water in there and you've seen something swimming around. It is a good thing sometimes when you go to get that cup to look on the inside just to make sure. You see, the Pharisees of that day and time, the religious people of that day and time, they were more concerned about the outside. For you see, the outside is what everybody else sees. The outside is what the world sees. The inside is what God sees. Folks, He knows our heart. You're not hiding anything from God. You may think you can. And you may can hide it from mom and daddy and grandma and grandpa and the church. You may can hide it from the world, but you cannot hide it from God. Never can. Never will. The Pharisees thought they could. They thought they had. But really in their life, as Jesus was telling them what was right and what was wrong, man, they didn't want to change. They were paralyzed to just stay the way that they were. There's a principle that Jesus taught throughout His ministry of cleaning the inside of the cup. He says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be provided unto you. Seek first, he says, the kingdom of God. Not whether the cup is good on the outside. Seek first the inside. And then in Matthew chapter 15, verse 11, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it's what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Hey, is that not true or not? Man, we can talk about it all we want to. It is what comes out that really shows who we are on the inside. Verse 18 of that same Matthew chapter 15 says, But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. The last part of that verse says this, And this defiles a person. What comes out of our mouth, what comes from our heart, is what defiles us. Because of their paralysis, the Pharisees of that day and time had lost their influence. Jesus called them hypocrites right out front. They proclaimed to know the truth, but they were full of lies. Listen 
to me here, mom and dad, to make that home and to have that home feel advantage, to make that a place, that home, a, a place of what God would have it to be. We need to make sure that our influence on our children is what it should be. So I'm telling you here, be careful. An act of stupidity, immorality, can change everything. It has, and it does. We need to pursue that purity, but we also need to desire divine approval. Listen, in verse 28 in that text, Jesus said, In the same way on the outside you seem righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Folks, this is the deadly trout that's out there. That deadly trout of being more concerned about our appearance to the world, what our character is to the world, instead of what is right and true in the eyes of God. Now, I'll go ahead and say this. It's probably true, I dare say, just about at least, for everybody in this room. There has been a time in our lives where we have liked and enjoyed the applause of men. Oh, so-and-so, pat us on the back. Oh, wow, that's great. I love it when someone says to me, and I'm not going to call any names or try not to look in their direction, but when somebody walks out the door and says, Hey, preacher, I enjoy that sermon today. Don't get the big head. I don't want the big head. We need to have a big heart. We just need to love the Lord. We just need to share God's Word. We just need to be who God wants us to be, ladies and gentlemen. And when we analyze our life and see that there's some things that maybe we need to change, then don't be, then avoid the idea of paralysis. Make the change. You see, I really believe that's one of the issues that so many believers have today. If you're really dry and you're really striving, it's not that God hasn't revealed to you what you need to do. It's not that God hasn't revealed to you, you know what? You need to be more dedicated to lot to me. You know, you know what? You need to read your Bible more. You know what? You ought to go to church more. It's not that God hasn't revealed to you what you need to do. You and I just have a trouble sometimes doing it. We worry about the world. Or we worry about somebody else. When really all we need to do is seek the Lord. And we are called to seek the approval of God, not men. Here's the thing about that. And listen to me real close. You can seek God's approval. And you know what? If you do your very best, you love the Lord, you try, I'm not going to be perfect, nobody is, but you can find God's approval. You really can. If you try hard enough, you can find God's approval. As a child of God, you can find God's approval. As a person here today who may need to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, listen, He loves you. You can find God's approval in a personal relationship with Christ. But if you flip that coin around, I can go ahead and tell you right now, man's approval, that changes. You can be the person today in the world... <laughs> And listen, in this woke society that we have today, you can be on top of the world today and you can be the scum of the earth tomorrow just because you said something or did something or something that happened. Somebody went back and looked on your Twitter account 20 years ago. Can you believe what this person said? Oh my goodness. Man, I tell you what. I don't know about you guys, but I'm glad when God, when, when, when the old devil, I'll say it this way, when the old devil brings up Tim McCaffrey's 20 years ago, 
I can look at him and say, man, listen, you're talking about stuff that's already been forgiven. You're talking about stuff that God's already put as far as the east is from the west. Man, just leave me alone. You and I can find God's approval, but it takes us avoiding this paralysis of life to get past all that. you got to do something. Find those priorities. Analyze them. Some of the great hymns that we have, man, there are so many. A couple real quickly, just a few sentences from each. One is entitled, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And what I love about the old hymns that we, I, well, I pray, will always continue to sing. Man, there's some good words there. Not just, just don't sing them without thinking about what you're saying, but when I survey the wondrous cross, my richest gain, I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to His blood. Another is entitled, I am resolved. The words say, I am resolved no longer to linger charmed by the world's delights. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. Folks, avoid the paralysis of doing nothing. Analyze those priorities. And then lastly this morning, acknowledge our need for provision. There are several places in our text where Jesus describes these Pharisees as being blind. Just blind. So sad, is it not? To be so close to the truth. So close to an eternity of, of relationship with God. So close, yet so far. Being close is only good in what? Horseshoes and hand grenades. I just wanted to throw that out there. I'm... These younger group may not have ever heard that. They need to know that. Well, folks, let me tell you something. Being close to God doesn't count. Being close to having a relationship with Him doesn't count. You can be right on the edge. You can know all the right things. Do all the supposedly right things, but if your heart isn't right, then none of that matters. And that's what Jesus was trying to say to the Pharisees of that day. That's what He was trying to say to us today. Guys, we can be so close and yet so far. We need the provision of Christ in our life. No matter what. To make our home, that home field, advantage. I want to end this morning with a little essay entitled, Someday. This essay was written by Charles Swindle. He's written a lot of books and uh, it's pretty neat. As we think about making our home a field of dreams, as we think about doing and being everything that Christ would have us to be, parents and grandparents and individuals, just to analyze the priorities of where we are in life to avoid the paralysis of, listen to me now, walking out that door today lost when you know that today you need to give your life to Jesus. To acknowledge today that you have a need for a provision of Christ that only Christ 
can give. Someday, Charles writes, when the kids are grown, things are going to be a lot different. The garage won't be full of bikes, electric train tracks on plywood, saw horses surrounded by chunks of two-by-fours, nails, a hammer, a saw, unfinished experimental projects, and a rabbit cage. I'll be able to park both cars neatly in just the right places and never again stumble over skateboards, a pile of papers, save for the school's fun drive, a bag of rabbit food which is now spilled, Someday, when the kids are grown, the kitchen will be incredibly neat. The sink will be free of sticky dishes. The garbage disposal won't get choked on rubber bands or paper cups. And the refrigerator won't be clogged with nine bottles of milk. And we won't lose the tops to jelly jars, ketchup bottles, and peanut butter, the margarine, or the mustard. The water jar won't be put back in empty. The ice trays won't be left out overnight. You can tell how old this is by that. The blender won't stand for six hours coated with the remains of a midnight malt. And the honey will stay inside the container. Someday, when the kids are grown, my lovely wife will actually have time to get dressed leisurely. A long hot bath without three panic interruptions. Time to do her nails, even her toenails, if she pleases. Without answering questions and reviewing spelling words. Having had her hair done that afternoon without trying to squeeze it in between racing a sick dog to the vet and a trip to the on oncologist or on orthodontist, excuse me, <laughs> with a kid in a bad mood because she lost her headgear. Someday when the kids are grown, the instrument called a telephone will actually be available. Again, how old this writing is. It won't look like it's growing from a teenager's ear. It will simply hang there, silently and amazingly available. It will be free of lipstick human saliva, mayonnaise, corn chip crumbs, and toothpicks stuck in those little holes. Some of y'all did that. Some of y'all don't have a clue what I'm talking about, but some of y'all did that. Someday when the kids are grown, I'll be able to see through the car windows. Fingerprints, tongue licks, Sneaker footprints and the dog tracks, which nobody knows how, will be conspicuous by their absence. The back seat won't be a disaster area. We won't sit on jacks and crayons anymore. The tank will not always be somewhere between empty and fumes. And glory to God, I won't have to clean up dog messes another time. Someday, when the kids are grown... We will return to normal conversations. You know, just plain American talk. Gross won't, be, won't punctuate every sentence seven times. Yuck will not be heard. Hurry up, I gotta go. Will not accompany the banging of fists on the bathroom door. It's my turn. Won't call for a referee. And a magazine article will be read in full without interruption. Someday, when the kids are grown, we won't run out of toilet tissue. My wife won't lose her keys. We won't forget to shut the refrigerator door. I won't have to dream up new ways of diverting attention from a gumball machine or have to answer, Daddy, is it a sin that you're driving 47 in a 35 mile per hour zone? Our promise to kiss a rabbit good night. Or wait up forever until they get home from dates. Or have to take a number to get a word in at the supper table.
Yes, someday, when the kids are grown, things are going to be a lot different. One by one, they'll leave our nest. And the place will begin to resemble order and maybe even a touch of elegance. The clink of china and silver will be heard on occasion. The crackling of the fireplace will echo throughout the hallway. The phone will be strangely silent. The house will be quiet and calm and always clean and empty and filled with memories and lonely and we won't like it at all. And we'll spend our time not looking forward to someday, but looking back to yesterday and thinking maybe we can babysit the grandkids and get some life back into this place. I wonder for all of us to make that home a field of dreams today. Folks, someday it will all be over. Someday those precious little ones will be gone. And so for you and I, as a church, as a family, as your family, together, may we make our home a field of dreams. A place where they want to come back home. A place where they want to raise their kids in church. A place where their heart is right with God. Someday is coming. What will you do today? Pray with me. Father, thanking You for this day and for every opportunity that we have, I pray, Father, to be more like You. Father, You know our hearts and lives. You know every need, every person that is here today. Father, some who, who just need to be right with You. Maybe they've avoided that change in their life for a long time. And Father, I pray that if Your Spirit is speaking to them today, leading them today, that Father, today may be that day they say yes to Jesus. Father, I pray for all of us, as we grow up, as our kids grow up, our grandkids grow up, as life changes, that today becomes that someday, Father, may You move in our hearts and lives today. May Your will be done today, Father, I pray. This is Your time. Father, it's Your invitation. The altar is open. May Your will be done, I pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Stand together with me. Let's sing this morning. Whatever God puts on your heart, I invite you to come.